Brains are impressive because of the number and connections of their cells, but there are lots of other different kinds of cells in the body, and they all have the same basic structure inside. This is a typical animal cell, a model of a typical animal cell. And it's not just a bag of juice, it's filled with membranes. It's got a structure, an internal structure. Each of these blue things here is a membrane. And every cell has them in large amounts, such that the total area of membrane inside a typical human body is about 200 acres. That's a good-sized farm. What are they all doing? Well, they aren't just sort of stuffing or folded wadding. Those membranes, in many cases, are chemical factories, particularly the ones in these bodies called mitochondria, the orange ones here. They are made of membrane. And in those membranes, in every bit of those membranes, is going on chemistry. They are chemical factories. This here is a map of the chemical reactions in every cell. Mind-bogglingly complicated, stupefyingly complicated. Every one of these arrows is one chemical reaction. Yet all of that, all of that, is going on all the time inside the membranes of every mitochondrion in every cell in you. And the number of mitochondria in which that's going on all the time is such that if you laid all your mitochondria end to end, they would go around the world not once, not 25 times, but 2,000 times. In the nucleus of the cell, right in the center, is the DNA. The DNA the magic molecule, the molecule of life, the most important molecule in the world. That molecule conveys the information from generation to generation about how to build a body. The total amount of information is such that if you were to eat a steak, when you eat a steak, every time you do it, your teeth are mangling, are shredding the equivalent of a billion copies of the Encyclopedia Britannica. That's the kind of destructive work you can do with your teeth. Hemoglobin is the molecule that carries oxygen in the blood. You can see it, the shape of it is complicated. It's very complicated and what's remarkable about it is that the same shape is going on all the time in all the different molecules. That you can think of the hemoglobin molecule as rather like a truck for, con for carrying oxygen. Each hemoglobin molecule drives around carrying oxygen from one part of the body to another. It's a vehicle for carrying oxygen. But I've just got six little trucks here. What's remarkable about hemoglobin is that the number of them in your bloodstream is not just six, it's 6,000 million, million, million. And they're all very complicated, they all look like that, they all look exactly the same as each other. And they're all being destroyed and new ones being created all the time in your blood at a rate of 400 million, million every second. Another way to shake off the anaesthetic of familiarity Another way to experience something a little bit like going to another planet is to go on another kind of journey backwards in time on our own planet. The best way to do this would be with a time machine. But even Bryson Gore and the Royal Institution can't lay on a time machine for us, so we have to use fossils. One of the most difficult things to grasp about fossils, like this trilobite here, is how old they are. You can have no conception how old that animal is. In case that sounds patronizing, let me rephrase it. I can have no conception how old it is. I can tell you in words how old it is. It's about 500 million years old, perhaps a bit more. But to tell you in words and really to understand what that means is another matter. Our brains have evolved to comprehend the timescales of our own lifetimes. We can understand seconds, minutes, days, weeks, years, even centuries, we can understand. When we come to millennia, thousands of years, our spines start to tingle. Epic myths like Homer's Odyssey, tales of the Greek gods, Zeus and Apollo and the others, the Jewish heroes 
Moses and Joshua and their god Yahweh, the ancient Egyptians and the sun god Ra. These all give us an eerie feeling of immense age. We feel that we're peering back into the mists of antiquity. Yet on the time scale of this fossil, those mists of antiquity don't even count as yesterday. This is a cuneiform tablet from Mesopotamia somewhere around the 7th century BC. It's, let me see, my cuneiform's a bit rusty. Yes, it's a legal document on the sale of some land near Nineveh. Yes, that's right. Uh, this here is another thing that gives one the same feeling. This is a Bronze Age warrior's mask that was dug up in the last century by a, a famous 19th century archaeologist, Schliemann. And he said, I have gazed upon the face of Agamemnon. Now, this, as a matter of fact, it wasn't the face of Agamemnon, but he thought it was. And to him, that was his way of being awed, being awed at the immense age of it. He was feeling himself going back through those mists of antiquity. Let's try to get a feel for how old things really are, and then try to fit our trilobite onto the same scale. I'm going to take one pace to represent a thousand years, and I'm going to start at the time of the first Christmas. So this little brooch here dates from the time of the first Christmas, naught BC. If I take one pace, I'm back at a thousand BC, about the time of the tablet that we've just been looking at, about the time of King David. Another pace, 2000 BC, and this Bronze Age axe head. Another pace, 3000 BC, about the time just before the building of the Egyptian pyramids. Another pace, this piece of pottery, 4000 BC, about the time when Archbishop Usher calculated the beginning of the world and Adam and Eve. But we've hardly started yet. We've got a long way to go. Walking from one side of the green bench to the other, we've gone back to 4000 BC. <coughs> this is Homo habilis. She, or someone very like her, is our direct ancestor. She lived two million years ago. To get back to her time, you would need, on the same scale of pacing, to go about two kilometers, quite a long way. Now, we've got some more ancestral portraits, and I'm going to call them up in order. So will the person who's standing, who's sitting behind Australopithecus, the first one, please stand up. Thank you. That's Australopithecus. Uh, he is probably a, a direct ancestor of this one. He lived about um, three million years ago. So we'd have to walk three kilometers to get to his time. Now the next person, please. Thank you. That's Ramapithecus. That would be possibly an ancestor not just of us, but also of all the great apes. And he's about uh, 14 kilometers away on our scale. The next one, please. Thank you. Uh, that's an early primate. And that, to get to that one, you'd have to walk to about Hemel Hempstead to get to the, to the age of that creature. The next one, please. An early mammal about Luton, that distance. Next one. An insectivore uh, with, the little, um, with the little millipede in its jaws. Um, maybe... Newport Pagnell. The next one, please. That's an early mammal-like reptile, and its distance is about Manchester. The next one. An amphibian. Middlesbrough. And the next. Right, that's a fish just coming out of water, just leaving the water and coming to the land, and its distance is, is about Carlisle. And I've left, do sit down now, thank you very much. Those are all your ancestors. <laughs> this one is the oldest of all the ones we've got here. It's about the same age as the trilobite that we started with. They might have met. This is Pikaia, and in order to find its age, you would have to slog it out all the way from here to Glasgow. And remember that our perception of historical time, back to the mists of antiquity, is a couple of paces across this green table. 